All right. So we're live now. I'm here with Ben Watkins again and John Fisher 2.0, who's new to the channel. And hopefully people can hear me. But I'll let you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves. And I've got links to your channels in the description. So um, Ben, I'll let you go first. Okay, so my name's Ben Watkins. So I'm a host of Real Atheology, a philosophy of religion podcast, where we explore questions in the philosophy of religion from non-theist perspectives and to see if we can help um, forward the dialogue between atheists and theists. Um, yeah. All right, awesome. All right, my name is John Fisher 2.0. I'm a Roman Catholic. I have my own channel at Original Wind Productions. Um, normally, I don't engage with uh, atheists. I, I haven't for a while. It's usually been a more of an intra-Catholic dialogue page, but I'm kind of opening it wide up again. And I have to say about uh, real atheology, I used to bemoan the fact that new atheists didn't read us and, and sophisticated theologians and how, oh, it was really nothing to take seriously. And then the real atheology guys came up, took up that challenge and was basically like, uh, yeah, we read all the stuff you guys told us to and now we're ready. And now I'm like, oh, well, I have no excuse not to actually look at that stuff myself and actually respond back. So I'm actually glad that these sorts of dialogues are, are happening. And it, it's a real step up from like the 2014 internet atheism that uh, I used to know. Oh, definitely. All right, so the format's going to be that Ben's going to give his opener, then John will give his, and then it'll be open dialogue for a little while, and then at the end we'll do a little bit of Q&A like normal. So with that, um, Ben, why don't you go ahead and start? Sure. Okay, so I take the topic of tonight to be um, characterizing um, a view in what's known as meta-ethics. So ethics is the study of first order um, moral questions. So, you know, things like what ought I do? What should I do? What sort of life should I live? Um, but meta-ethics is about second order um, ethical questions. Questions like what is goodness? What is wrongness? What do we mean by those terms? What sorts of things are picked out in the world by these sorts of concepts. And so the meta-ethical landscape is broad, um, but two, the two views that we're gonna hone in tonight on are uh, ethical non-naturalism and ethical naturalism. And so it might sound a little paradoxical, I know because this terminology is not the best um, within the context of philosophy of religion because I'm the atheist slash metaphysical naturalist who's defending the non-naturalist view. And um, John is a theist. You know, he's not a metaphysical naturalist, but he's an ethical naturalist. So it just goes to show you just how widely different these terms can be used across philosophical differences, uh, disciplines and areas of inquiry and can lead to some confusion. So the first thing I want to do is kind of sketch out the ethical non-naturalist position and what all that entails. And so basically the thesis is that some things matter in a moral sense. Um, so this view is committed to the idea that there are some moral sentences that can be true or false. Um, so some form of cognitivism is true. Um, some moral sentences are true. And some moral sentences are true by properties other than attitudes or responses. And so that's an objectivist thesis. Um, and then what's uniquely non-naturalist is a non-naturalist thesis. It's the idea that moral or other ethical properties are not identical to any set of non-normative properties. So they, so ethical properties and ethical facts is just its own domain of facts. And so um, when we're talking about morality, we're talking about how th some things might matter. Um, and so I think there's about four broad ways in which things might matter. So there's a psychological sense um, where something's mattering consists of attitudes or motivational responses toward things. Um, there's a reason implying sense where there are normative reasons for everyone to care about some things. 
Um, there's a rule implying sense. Um, so certain rules distinguish what is allowed or disallowed or correct or incorrect, you know, things like laws or rules of etiquette. Um, and then a command implying sense. So something's mattering involves commands from an authority. And so I think ethical naturalists have available to them three of those four um, ways in which things might matter. But it's the reason implying sense that I think is unique to ethical non-naturalism. It's this idea that there are actual normative reasons in the world. So we're realists about reasons. And so when we um, make mistakes in ethical reasoning, when we take these reason implying senses of mattering and we try to identify them with something natural, the ethical non-naturalist is going to want to say that this commits the naturalistic fallacy. And so we have to cash out what it is the naturalistic fallacy is. Well, I can't do that now until I first characterize what ethical naturalism is. So it's much the same as ethical non-naturalism in the sense that they believe that um, both views think that there are moral sentences that can be true or false and that some are true. Um, but ethical naturalists aren't wedded to an objectivist thesis. So subjectivists is a form of ethical naturalism. Um, but they deny the non-naturalist thesis, the idea that moral properties are not identical to some set of non-normative properties. Ethical naturalists say, no, ethical properties are identical to some set of non-normative properties. So this is the ethical naturalist's reductionist thesis. So that takes the reason implying sense of mattering off the table. So naturalists have to construct a meta-ethical theory using either a psychological sense, a rule implying sense, or a command implying sense. And that's just a straightforward implication of the reductionist thes thesis. So the, that reductionist thesis is that ethical properties like goodness and wrongness are reducible to non-ethical or natural properties like maximizing pleasure or violating rules. Some property is a natural property if it can be characterized without using any ethical concepts. The, de the reductionist thesis denies a sharp distinction between how the world is and how the world ought to be. Ethical naturalism implies we can increase our moral knowledge of what we ought to do by studying the natural sciences like psychology, biology, neuroscience, anthropology, and maybe even uh, theology. And so I divide naturalism up into two broad camps, the analytic naturalist camp and the non-analytic naturalist camp. So the analytic naturalist camp says, look, we can reduce ethical terms and concepts to natural ones because they just mean the same thing. So let's say that we're hedonistic act utilitarians who believe that what we ought to do is maximize happiness. Um, the ethical not naturalist will say that, look, or the, not the analytical ethical naturalist is gonna say, look, maximizing happiness just means doing what is right or doing or some some act being right just means for it to maximize happiness and then there's non analytic versions of naturalism that say no look while these ethical and non-ethical concepts might mean different things they refer to the same property and so much like the concept of water and the concepts of, of concept of H2O mean different things, they still refer to the same thing. So <clears throat> how do I cash out this naturalistic fall fallacy? What are my arguments against ethical naturalism and in favor of ethical non-naturalism? Well, the first is, is that I think that it's just false that there isn't this reason implying sense. Ethical naturalists often have to be um, ethical have to be subjectivists about reasons just in general because they don't think that there are these uniquely ethical properties that we would call being a reason. So the first argument that I have against ethical non uh, ethical naturalism is uh, what's known as the ag agony argument. And so the agony argument is just the argument that we have reason to want to avoid future agony, but subjectivism about reason implies there is no such reason. Um, that we all have. So therefore, subjectivism about reasons is false. And so taking the subjectivism about reasons um, off the table, I think, is a huge blow to the naturalist 
um, project because it's saying, no, there is this deeper sense in which some things can matter, a way that's not going to be able to be cashed out in non-normative terms. Um, the second objection comes from um, basically just Hume's is ought distinction. So um, uh, David Hume famously um, distinguished between how the world is and how the world ought to be. And so uh, non-naturalists can modify um, Moore's existing open question argument into what's what I'm calling a normativity objection. The idea that the property of being contrary to our proper end would be a concrete non-normative property. But the property of being a wrong act would be an abstract normative property. And these two properties could not be identical, identical because they are in different non-overlapping categories. For the same reason rivers cannot be identical to sonnets, ethical properties cannot be identical to natural properties. Therefore, there are ethical properties that cannot be reduced to natural properties. And the last objection that I have is what's known as the triviality objection. And so the idea here is that some of our moral beliefs are might be informative truths. It, but if Thomistic ethical naturalism were true, then our moral beliefs could not be such truths. Therefore, this form of ethical naturalism could not be true. So the first point I want to make is that truths about the identity of some property can use two words or phrases that refer to the same property to tell us this property is the same as itself. Such claims only state trivial facts because everyone knows that everything is identical to itself. In order to state informative truths, our sentences about identity must give us positive information about the relation between two or more different properties. Moral claims are informative if we might disagree with them, or they might tell us something we did not already know. The perverted faculty argument is a Thomistic moral claim that might state an informative moral fact. So the take proposition A, acting contrary to our proper end is wrong. According to the Thomistic ethical naturalist, Proposition B, the property of being an act contrary to our proper end is the same as being wrong. We cannot use this first proposition to imply that if our acts were contrary to our proper ends, that they would also have the different property of being wrong, because Thomistic ethical naturalism implies there is no such different property. These two propositions have different meanings, but the first one would be a merely another way of stating the trivial fact that acting contrary to our proper end is acting contrary to our proper end. Consequently, our moral beliefs could not help us make decisions nor act right. How am I for time? I don't actually know. Um, you still got about four minutes or so. Okay, well, then I'll just wrap up um, because this last objection I know is super abstract. And most people would think, you know, like, well, well, why is this such a problem? Um, should this objection worry us? And I, I think that it should. And I want to try to outline with my remaining time why I think that this triviality obje objection is such a devastating objection to ethical naturalism. So let's imagine um, that we're also Thomists and that um, we believe that uh, and that you believe your proper end is to kill and eat your family. According to ethical naturalism, you must admit you morally ought to kill and eat your family, since this act would be your proper end. And acting in accord with our proper end is the same as being what we morally ought to do. Upon hearing this, your family is horrified and worried, so they call the authorities. When the authorities arrive, you might defend yourself by replying that when you believe you morally ought to kill and eat your family, you only stated the fact that this act would be your proper end. In your view, that is the property the concept of morally ought refers to. We weren't claiming that this act would have some different property of being what we morally ought to do because there is no such different property. You might add that even though you believe this act would have this property, that would not motivate you to act in this way. Your aim is to be a loving member of your family, whether or not is your proper end or not. Thus, your moral beliefs give your family no reason to worry, nor the authorities any reason to suspect you might be dangerous. I think these claims should worry both your family and the authorities. This view implies you don't really have a moral view at all, and it would be impossible to try to predict your future moral behavior 
based on your moral beliefs because your moral beliefs only state trivial facts. They could not help us decide what is good, how to act better, or for others to help uh, predict future behavior. So this view would be close to moral nihilism because all of our moral beliefs would only state trivial facts. So I want to say that my main uh, thesis tonight is that my view must be true because if my view is not true, then nihilism is true. And so I know that's like a really bold claim, um, but I think that's I think that's what's right because I think that if if this ethical non naturalist view is not true, then you're left with a view that has to deny that things matter in this reason and blind sense. And if you do that, well, then nothing really matters. And so all those views are just close denials. So I'll go ahead and end there. Um, I know I put a lot on the table, and hopefully I've uh, kind of sketched the landscape um, well enough so that John can lay out his view to try to uh, avoid um, the roadblocks that I've kind of set up in my opening. Yeah. I'll uh, turn it over to John now. Uh, ben, um, I, I want to apologize in advance because I, I'm sorry if I gave the impression that I was defending the Thomistic view, but um, I actually came here to defend uh, a kind of it's a view that's uh, propounded by uh, Johnny e. Hare. Well, some, it's inspired by him mostly. And what he does is he takes a lot of stuff from Duns Scotus and Immanuel Kant, and he basically tries to systematize it together. So I'm sorry, did you say you said R.M. Hare, right? No, no, uh, his son, John E. Hare. John E. Hare. Okay, I just want to make sure I heard you right. Yeah, uh, although they do borrow a lot, uh, they are both prescription uh, prescriptivists. Um, gotcha, gotcha. All right. By the way, would you mind if I turn on a PowerPoint presentation? Oh, please go right ahead. Yeah, awesome. You'll just need to add it to the people, or I don't know. There should have a share screen at the bottom. Okay. How about now? All right. Yes, cool. I can see it. Awesome. So basically, prescriptive realism and divine command theory. Um, it is ultimately uh, commands are themselves concrete. So um, that is something to keep in mind. It it's, it's a form of quote unquote supernaturalism, but strictly speaking, a lot of Ben's criticism still would apply to this uh, theory. And in fact, I'm pretty sure uh, ben would say it's some of these are actually more devastating. So uh, here we go. So the first thing we need to learn to get uh, right on this view is what are moral semantics? What do the words of our moral language mean? So we have descriptions, uh, how the world is or how things are in the world. So for example, if uh, St. John Fisher was fearless, uh, Stalin was a sociopath. Um, I agree you can't derive or deduce from descriptive terms any terms of value. So I will concede that to the is ought gap. Um, but I don't believe that one necessarily needs to derive an ought from an is in order to connect the two things together. And I'll get to that a little later. Values are our attitudes towards things in the world such that they dispose us to judge them. So for example, it's one thing to say St. John Fisher was fearless, it's another thing to say his fearlessness was commendable or Stalin's sociopathy was repugnant. And then we have obligations, which are commitments to one another given our evaluations, that is our judgments towards our values. And these are commitments in a Kantian sense and they are meant to be universalizable. Uh, so for example, if I'm going to uh, you know, use the most uh, stereotypical one, if I'm going to tell somebody I uh, don't lie, then it's universalizable in this sense. I'm kind of committing somebody else and even myself to the idea that um, they ought not to lie, given the fact that um, it corrupts our moral language, it leads to um, a distrust between the parties. Uh, basically, I'm giving some criteria and I'm evaluating those and I'm coming to a judgment that I'm binding to myself and I'm encouraging to bind to others. So this comes to part two of our moral semantics. Uh, what What is an ought? So if I was to say you ought to do X, um, I'm saying if I were you, I would do X given some criteria A, B, or C. 
and this is um, Hare's way of parsing it out. Um, if I say I ought to do X, I'm saying I am. if I am in this situation, I should do X given some criteria A, B, or C. Notice here whether or not moral claims are true, the semantics would still be used as a way of communicating moral disagreement. So it's not just a matter of um, boo, yay language. It's, it's uh, cognitive in nature. And then you have X is good, which is just a way of saying, I'm commending and endorsing my attraction to X as something worth doing and the underlying normative system. So this is what's called a functional definition. This is how I'm using the term and what the term um, is and um, how you should understand it. And it doesn't commit myself to a particular moral ontology, at least as I use it. Um, I might have an idea of what my underlying normative system is, but that can change from person to person. Or they can just be very particular about it and just think that um, it's something which is self-encouraged. The point is, on the face of it, it doesn't really, we can be quietest about whether we're realists or anti-realists using this sort of language. It communicates the judgment of the agent and it's, and the act of commending, that is the act of taking up the, uh, taking up your uh, value of something is done first and then the commending of it, suggesting it to others is done afterwards. So you might have a certain draw to a particular action. Uh, let's say, for example, I meet an old high school flame. Uh, we reconnect. I find out she's married. She wants. Uh, she's miserable. She wants to leave that. And then she comes to me. I can be very drawn to that idea. But at the end, if I assess my criteria, I could say my criteria are going to overturn that uh, value as much as I really value that prospect. So values are objective in that they are dependent on attributes of the world, which dispose us to see them in a certain way. So here's the analog. Values are like our apprehending redness. Things with wavelengths around 700 nanometers dispose us to seeing red. While colors require agents to see them, the dispositional properties of the wavelength exist in the nature of things. So this would be hair. Uh, so this would be kind of hair's way of parsing it out. Values seem to be sort of a weak supervenience relation. Uh, there's something by supervenience, I mean there is no difference in one without the other. So if we see if we see something as red, that is, we see a certain wavelength of red, it is not going to appear to us blue unless the wavelength changes and becomes shorter. And then there's our evaluations, our judgments about our values and which and actions which we are committed to. While we may be drawn in by our values, our judgments are what justify our actions according to the dictates of practical reason. So obligations are ultimately the duties we have to God and the duties he issues through his creation, either revelation or nature, to act in a certain way. Uh, they're what constitute our obligations. And, but that doesn't mean that we need to know what they are exactly to have an idea or a sense of what they are. So while we might come to these obligations using independent thinking and the criteria, and that's even enough for non-believers and believers to discuss amongst themselves, um, at where we could all just uh, reason and give criteria and affirmation to one another, at the end of the day, um, the judgment is ultimately gonna be right whether or not it corresponds to the will that God has for each of us to act to, accord to a particular set of duties. Then we have what's considered like a moral anthropology what kind of moral agents are we? And should we assume that we are? Human beings have two affections, an affection for the things we value and an affection to act uh, given proper value judgments. Human beings are agents capable of acting through their free will. Human beings are agents who are necessarily dependent on language to um, communicate ideas to themselves or others. Human beings act freely when they act for the sake of obtaining their values or acting independently to come to the right conclusions themselves but rather in freely entrusting um, that other, uh, the others and acting autonomously in the role of citizens. So uh, what's that last part saying? Essentially what we're saying here is, look, you're not acting freely just because you uh, pursue the values and the things you value. Um, you could pursue what makes you happy all day, but that doesn't really seem to cut it for uh, being a moral citizen. 
And on the other hand, it's rather coming to the proper value judgments, which seem to say that, yeah, you're acting freely. You're If we were just doing what we wanted all day, that's, that's not free will. That's not um, us acting in a morally responsible way. That's just chasing our own passions. Um, but rather we need to come to, we need, we're commendable in the sense that we've come to the right judgments. And although we do not know this categorically, that is by unaided reason, all humans are drawn to value and to be co-lovers with the one God. So event, essentially all of creation, all of existence is, is giving us a sense of what we ought to love and moving us towards it. However, we must freely submit. That is to say, um, if we was, if we were to know what God was like, if we were to know the good and see it just like we would see a color, um, then we would be so attracted to it, we wouldn't be freely consenting to it, but rather we would just be chasing our affections for uh, for God. And that's why it's not some, God's essence is not something we reason ourselves to, but rather it's something that we know and hope for indirectly. So an example of this would probably be like, uh, Imagine Mary uh, in a room. She doesn't know the, what the color red is like. And an interesting fact is that any surface area that is red um, is only going to be red and it's not going to be blue. But here's the thing. If you look at it from our language, um, blue is not this analytically the same as non-red. Blue is a completely different thing. And unless somebody knows or has experiences with color, it's not really going to seem like a, an empirical question, but at the same time, it doesn't really seem like something that you deduce just from the terms. So that's basically what kind of situation we're in with uh, God's essence. It's something we can't apprehend as being the good, but if we were to see it, then it's something we would clearly uh, come to grips with. And this is where it comes to our moral epistemology. Moral duties and values are known by an innate love of God mediated through creation. Non-believers and believers uh, can consider one another's value and criteria for evaluating their judgments. God's command, whether through nature or revelation, is given to enable us to be citizens of his kingdom, one who freely submit to him, not because of our treasure or our happiness in God, as much as God himself, but because we treasure God. Since we do not know God's essence, we do not know how or why God's essence is the ultimate good. We ought to value, but it's something we postulate and believe as a truth and as a commitment of practical reason. Practical reason uh, uh, would be beliefs we posit for the sake of fulfilling our commitments to ourselves and to one another. Um, so for example, uh, the popular Pascal's wager would be an instance of uh, a practical uh, argument in the sense that it argues that belief in God is reasonable, not necessarily that God exists. In a similar way, that's what we're postulating when we say God's essence is the good, or God just is the good. It's not something we have prior reasons for, it's just something we postulate out of practical reason. So why postulate a belief in God? Well, uh, one argument that's inspired by here is what's called the uh, moral perfection argument. So if we're committed to acting in a way which is morally perfect, uh, then we have to also commit ourselves to believing that we can act in this perfect way. And if we are committed to the idea that we can act in this perfect way, we're kind of committed to God existing. Um, I don't have, so in terms of going over for the justifications for the premise, uh, the first premise should be understood in this way. It seems that um, whenever we hold ourselves and others to a moral standard, we should act consistently and always try to uphold it. And we could always say, well, that just means that we should attempt, well, what's considered a good attempt? For the price you pay for going to a movie, that money can go to feeding the poor. Uh, consider what Peter Singer does, where he contributes quite a bit of his own money to a charity and helping people in developing nations. Why should he be the exception rather than the rule? And if we're committed to acting in this morally perfect way, what are we trying to achieve here? Well, we're trying to achieve the idea that we can come come to be morally perfect. And it seems in light of that, we need some sort of afterlife, some sort of religious system that makes it uh, that uh, that possible. Uh, I'm not going to address the Euthyphro dilemma, but um, I do want to address the, oh, the is ought gap and the open question argument. So I'm going to address them mostly in their... Uh, 
classical forms. Um, so I agree that we can't get um, a bunch of oughts from ises. That much is true, but I would state that um, God's commands co should be understood as a constituting relationship, like uh, water con H2O constitutes water. And it's not something that I'm going to justify based off of some sort of series of deduction, but rather on the practical considerations I just gave. And also we can't deduce an odd from an, and um, the same thing stands for uh, deriving an odd from an is. Uh, by the way, how am I for time? Did I go over? You still have a couple of minutes. Yeah, oh, I, think right. I think you're doing great. Oh, thank you. So well, one thing to address here is in terms of, um, the is odd gap. Yeah, not going to touch that. The open question argument, I think, and I'm glad you reformulated, Ben, the original sounds a, a little too strong if we were to accept its conclusions. Um, but suppose you were to say, well, it seems that knowledge is an open question. What is knowledge? And if I was to say knowledge is, I don't know, true justified belief, aren't I really saying true justified belief is true justified belief? That seems too easy. Uh, ben, you kind of... Uh, you kind of gave a far more nuanced way of uh, showing that dilemma. And in terms of what you said about, you know, uh, the uh, triviality objection, uh, let's say um, e eternal agony or pain. Um, it seems that there's no reason for avoiding future agony. Um, I, that's the one I wanted to address. Uh, St. Paul actually said uh, in scripture, would I not be forsaken and eternally damned if it meant my brother's uh, that is, the Jews who uh, did not accept Christianity could rejoice with God. And that's actually something e even Presbyterian ministers used to say, would I be damned in eternity if it meant the glorifying of God for eternity? So in terms of future agony, uh, that is actually a bullet I'd, I'd be willing to bite. Um, it, it's not one that I think a lot of people would find intuitive, but there you are. And um, now in now, um, I think I'm just going to stop here and maybe we could actually dialogue about where we're going uh, with one another's model. And uh, it, would that be cool? Oh, absolutely. Oh, awesome. Because um, so, I think it's – so you're not defending a expli explicitly Thomistic model. And so I think that's that's good um, in the sense that, that I, th I use Thomistic examples in – my arguments, I think my arguments can be reformulated to apply mm. to your stuff, but that just avoids that whole pro, you know, you don't have to defend a perverted ba faculty argument. You don't have to defend a privation of goodness view. You don't, you know, so same page there. Um, uh, although I will say this much, um, the uh, the privation of goodness view, I, I would actually uphold. Yeah, actually. As, as being true. Uh, yeah. Char yeah, characterize your, your stance on that. That seems like a great place to start then. Oh, all right. So, mm, all right. So something has to be understood in terms of the background of how that idea became very popular. So there's a certain kind of Manichaean form of the um, argument from evil, which is God created everything. Evil is a thing. Therefore, God created evil. So... The premise that you want to deny is that God created evil, but but how? Um, well, you deny the premise that evil is a thing, that is a substance, something which exists onto itself. So obviously, I don't think anyone believes in that. I don't think anyone can go and say, can I get a cup of evil or, or, or something akin to that? Um, so evil has to be understood in a, a sense which isn't substantive, that is, it doesn't exist exist in and of itself, but rather it exists through things and through imperfections, things lacking what they should have. Uh, so for example, somebody who is um, who is obese might lack the virtue of uh, of tem of temperance or you know prudence with their food, some some kind of virtue like that. So it's kind of that um, that notion of privation uh, that I'd go with. And, and, you know, that's not even something someone who's more deontological needs to deal with because what is evil, but you know, someone just breaking their obligations, that's not substantive. That's more of a relational um, uh, nature of evil. So that's just what I mean. I just, by uh, evil is a privation of the good. I just mean that evil isn't substantive. Uh, and that's about it. I, I don't think I really need too much other than that. Gotcha. Um, 
so I guess where do we want to where, actually where, uh, may I ask may I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Oh, all right. Redhead. So on, on your view, would you consider um, things which are good uh, or the good to be something like and values and, and all that other stuff, things to be uh, abstract objects, uh, something like uh, numbers uh, uh, for people who are, uh, you know, Platonist about math, uh, something like that? Yes. So I, um, I believe that they are universals. So okay. I think it's just um, trivially true um that there are universals in the world and so that these are um properties that particular things have mm -hmm. so when you say i can't go out into the world and get a cup of evil i think that's right because um a cup of something would be a you know a cup of something particular mm -hmm. whereas you know something being good is going to be a universal property so it's mm -hmm. um you know it's going to be something that properties have so you're not going to be able to just the idea of getting a cup of goodness or a cup of redness mm -hmm. just makes the category mistake. Right. Um, that the uh, ethical non naturalist wants to emphasize. So, look, these two mm -hmm. things really do occupy two different domains. Just right. like rivers and sonnets are just in two entirely entirely different categories of thing. Mm hmm. Um, natural facts and ethical facts are in two mm. non-overlapping domains. And, and that brings me to a second point in terms of uh, your, your epistemology in, in knowing these abstract, because, you know, abstract, uh, I don't think abstract are, uh, at least most Platonists don't describe their um, ideas of abstract as causally efficacious on, on the world itself. So, for sure. example, the number two, so redness, uh, for example, doesn't make something red. Um, something being a certain wavelength uh, makes something red. Um, what uh, redness does is more or less make facts about redness true, Some, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. am, am I in the ballpark? Yes. So mm -hmm. um, ethical non-naturalists have what's called a supervenience thesis on okay. um, the idea that Moral properties are abstract properties that supervene on natural properties. So again, mm -hmm. if we imagine that we're hedonistic act utilitarians, right. we would say that the property of being a right act supervenes on the property of maximizing happiness, mm -hmm. such that you couldn't have any change in um, moral properties without having a corresponding change in natural properties. Um, and so this is because we obviously want to preserve the intuition that if there was a possible world identical to our world in all of its non-moral respects, um, there would, it would, it would still be the case that something like the Holocaust was morally wrong. There right. isn't a possible world that's exactly like our world in all of its natural facts, but then in which the Holocaust isn't morally wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that's the supervenience thesis that's. And, and so that's, again, a, another very sharp distinction that's mm -hmm. being drawn between natural facts and non-natural facts is that non-natural facts supervene on natural facts and not the other way around. So I'm just going to ask one question and then we can switch gears and you can start asking me one because I, I don't want to put you too much under pressure. Oh, you're very, you're very. Right. Okay, so one of the difficulties, of course, are like these evolutionary debunk debunking arguments. So, for example, it's not a matter of these abstract objects existing, but how we come to know them. So, for example, facts about how we evolve, they seem contingent. Um, and that would also include yes. the ways we think about the world also being contingent, too, on this process. Yes. Now, now, it seems possible that there could be a world where there could be... Uh, beings just like us, but who evolved faculties where um, who evolved faculties where by them we've come to learn things that we have animals in the world that believe it or who act according to it. So, for example, there are animals that eat the young of the competitors of other males. They just do. They don't see anything wrong with that. Uh, chimps have very aggressive um, social patterns and hierarchies. And yet bonobos are considered the opposite, where they're all just uh, loving and, and carefree. They're basically the hippies. The point is, uh, we, 
there are so many different animals who evolved so many different norms and also it doesn't seem like these moral facts would have uh, interacted with us in a way we could have known them in the way like uh, my eyes, for example. My eyes would have developed because there would be an ancestor who developed skin that was sensitive to the light around it. And of course, that just became a lot more complex with uh, development over time and certain environmental pressures. There is a certain sense in which uh, physical objects interact with one another such that we build uh, cognitive fa uh, faculties to adapt to our environment. And yet that doesn't seem to be the case with moral with uh, anything which can make a moral fact true. Um, other animals develop different moral norms and understandings. So it, it seems like on the evolutionary thesis that um, this model of yours can, can really hold the fort. It, it seems like you might be stuck in a position where you're going to be a filthy creationist science denier, or you're going to be uh, in a position where you say, you know what, um, I have to agree with the moral nihilist on this one. This is the high level bar I'm setting for ethics, uh, if it was to exist. And it, it seems like it's incompatible with the world around us. How, how would you kind of respond to that sort of argument? Sure. So I think that my view um, raises important um, ontological and epistemological difficulties. Mm -hmm. So on the ontological side, um, there's the argument from queerness. How can um, non-natural um, ethical properties fit into the furniture of the universe? Um, and I don't think that's a very big problem for the view. I think the bigger problem are the epistemological objections, the evolutionary debunking arguments. Because I think that my view does raise difficult ep epistemological questions like how is it that we come to know these irreducibly normative facts that we call moral facts? Well, I think that um, evolutionary debunking arguments lose their plausibility when we're not isolating the observation mm -hmm. or um, limiting the observation to just moral reasoning. So I think that um, rationality encompasses much more than just morality. I think there's mm. non-moral rationality. So the idea that not only can we have reasons to control our behavior, we can also have reasons to control our beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, so not only can things count in, favors of, in, in favor of our acting in certain ways, things can count in favor of our believing certain ways. Mm -hmm. So I start with the assumption that man is a rational animal, a rational animal in the sense that they can respond to reasons. And we were selected for this ability. We were selected for our ability to respond to reasons mm. in the world. Just like cheetahs were selected for speed and giraffes were selected for long necks, our ability to be rational animals was a feature we were selected for. And it is this feature of rational intuition and being able to use reason to understand and control the world around us that allows us to discover moral truths. So it's not that, you know, I don't think that mm -hmm. we were selected for our ability to play chess on the African savanna. We also weren't selected for our ability to discover moral truths. Mm -hmm. We were selected for our reasoning um, capacities. And it's those reasoning capacities that allow us to discover moral truths, learn how to play chess, develop calculus, create poetry. Um, that's the, you know... These are side effects, but I also think that being able to reliably mm -hmm. come to basic moral truth does have survival advantage. I think that if we are going to survive in a society, if we are going to be a complex society, there has to be some sort of way in which we can come to at least basic moral truths, things like keeping promises and avoiding pain. Mm -hmm. um, these are just, um, we wouldn't, you know, one of the things that allowed us as homo sapiens to outperform mm. other hominoid groups like Neanderthals was because of our ability to reason so well and be able, you know, there's only one moral truth. Mm -hmm. So if you're all, the more your people are able to reliably come to a basic um, understanding of basic moral truth, this one basic moral truth, mm. the more you're going to be able to cooperate together and the more the, the 
society is going to be able to flourish. Mm -hmm. And so I think we can give evolutionary explanations as to how we can come to moral knowledge. But I admit these are very difficult um, questions that we are only going to be able to give partial answers to because mm -hmm. our understanding of, uh, of biological evolution and moral cognition in neuroscience are just, they're too, we need resources from both fields and they're just both still very young. We still need to develop those. Um, mm. And so I think evolutionary debunking arguments stay on the table. They're still a part of the dialectic. Mm. And I think they will, a, predi a prediction of my view is that they will fade away in time as we develop more understanding mm. of moral cognition and the evolutionary biology, you know, these, the evolutionary psychological history of how we developed our moral cognition. Uh, okay. Uh, I would want to push back, but I think it's your turn to push back against me just so we can keep this dialogue uh, two way. And also, <laughs> I, I also, also, I don't think I'm in any position to say that your entities are queer considering that I'm, uh, a theist, a substance dualist, not like all the supernatural <laughs> stuff. So, Fair. so you're not going to get that from me, man. Uh, right. Well, so I want to push back on you mm -hmm. um, in that. So you laid out roughly a view of moral values and moral obligation right. at the beginning of your presentation. Mm -hmm. And so this is meant to be a view of, you know, like, hey, here's a theory that mm -hmm. applies to these features. Right. And so I want to say that my view is is more fundamental. I don't just give an understanding of moral value and moral obligation, but also of things like non-moral rationality, mm -hmm. things like, you know, things being evidence and thing reason, you know, reasons for acting in certain ways. So I think that one of the strengths of my view is that I can explain more. Mm -hmm using fewer concepts. Does that make sense? So the scope mm. of what I can cover with my irreducibly normative, non-naturalist conception of a reason mm -hmm. doesn't require the, the radically dualistic metaphysics of theism in its clockwork. Mm -hmm. So I can use that concept to develop a view of moral value moral obligation, epistemic value, epistemic obligation. Right. So I, I would want to push back there because, at, at, so this might sound like a bit of a two uh, quo, but um, to be fair, the people who are going to avoid the most of the dualisms are going to be uh, people who take positions like we should be nominalists, we should hold that uh, universals or something like resemblances, we should be nihilists about uh, moral truths and, and and things like that. And in exchange, we get just concrete objects, just the world of nature, just that. Um, I, I fear that just by asking, not as, I fear by uh, having a theory that um, requires some sort of universal, some sort of abstract uh, is, a, is a sort of dualism. It's a dualism between the concrete world and the abstract world. I, I think that it would still qualify. All I'm saying is that there are two domains, the natural and the supernatural. I, I think ultimately it breaks down into just those two. And I, I don't really need to um, go off and, and get uh, another sort of thing to, to exist. So uh, there is that. And the second thing to point out is when it comes to uh, God and human beings, there's, also, there's a sort of personal element that I, that I like. Um, when I speak about, you know, my obligations and duties and my values ultimately being a draw towards God uh, through creation, through other people, it, that's that's a, that's a whole social dynamic that goes on there. I, I don't really care. Why should I care what uh, a platonic object, the very existence of one, uh, dictates about what is good or bad? Um, when I think of letting myself down when I think of um, falling short of moral responsibility and feeling bad about myself and letting down others, letting down God, like that seems like a very personal sort of thing. Um, when I obey, when I feel drawn to obey a, a dictate, um, some sort of obligation, it, it feels like a call from authority. 
So I, I think it. I think my view is a sort of dualism that preserves that whole interpersonal dynamic, without um, without making my relationship or 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 the natural world's relationships the abstract um, impersonal. So I think that's probably one of the uh, virtues of my view. It, it considers morality to be a whole social dynamic, and it. I think it comports much better with our intuitions about that. So the first thing I want to say is that while I um, certainly admit that there is a radical divide between um, abstract uh, and concrete things, mm -hmm. that's, you know, the whole ethical non-naturalist project is to say that there are, there is yeah this sharp, there is this dualism in, in the world in the sense that there are these ethical facts and there are these non-ethical facts, but mm -hmm. these are still within the realm of natural law. And so what do I mean by this? So we would agree, like, I think you said this earlier, that abstract objects um, and concrete objects don't causally interact with, right. with, with one another. Mm -hmm. But so that's not something that we're going to be able to say when we draw something like the supernatural natural, mm -hmm. um, distinction because God causally interacts in the, in, in the world. So there's this causal domain that we're drawing that distinction through, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. with abstract objects, we're not. So I don't think it raises any problems. By, by admitting that there are these things called universals, because that also just seems, again, kind of an uninteresting, trivial truth. You know, something like, you know, yellow is a color. If, it is, if it's true that yellow is a color, and there has to be this universal yellow and this mm -hmm. universal color, well, then, yeah, there just are these universals that, you know, make these statements true. Um, so what I want to say next has to do with this idea of a personal theory um, that helps comport with some of our intuitions about obligation and authority. And so I think- And personal guilt, uh, don't forget I'm a Catholic. Guilt. So, I'm a Catholic, yeah. that's important. You have to emphasize <laughs> that. <laughs> um, so I kind of lost my thought. <laughs> it's, sorry. No, no, no. So um, what I'm what I'm trying to get at is that the this feature of morality that you, I think you're describing is what's called moral autonomy, and so I think it's my view that has the upper hand when it comes to characterizing what it is to be an, an autonomous moral agent. Mm -hmm. So moral to autonomy is the self governing of reasons and principles without the imposition of any external influences. Mm -hmm. So as rational animals, our reason implying capacities of self-governance mm -hmm. when considering what we should do is essential to our con to concepts like responsibility. Mm -hmm. So like unlike the externally imposed commands of an authority or the legislation of a state, mm -hmm. moral reasons and principles are self-imposed. Right. We are morally accountable to the self-contempt and inner abhorrence of each of our own conscious consciences. Mm -hmm. Our moral responsibility is the status of morally deserving praise and blame for acts with what we respect with, with, with mm -hmm. respect to what we owe to others. Mm -hmm. um, so for us to be morally responsible for acts, we must consciously reflect on our situation, form our own intentions, and then self direct what we believe to be the right course of action. We mm -hmm. couldn't accept an unqualified claim on our intentions by an authority or a legislator when deciding what we should do because such deliverance of will or subjugation is just incompatible with moral autonomy because autonomy, it, it just opts mm -hmm. out of moral, moral reasoning and responsibility altogether. Um, right. We couldn't give um, a divine commander or a legislator moral criticism, nor advice um, who has an unqualified claim on our obedience. So when you talk about the authority, the authority is, is self-imposed. It's something, so this is what we, we are, this is crucial to our concept right. of integrity. Integrity is doing the right thing, even when no one is looking. It's the idea of doing something right, 
simply because it's the right thing to do and not because you it's prudent or because you'll get some sort of self reward or because there's someone who is watching you or because someone has told you to do it but because it's the right thing to do and so um let me mm-hmm. just say one more i'll just say one more thing real quick because i know i've been kind of rambling um it's, it's the, cool. the example that that i really love is a shopping cart mm-hmm. uh, a shopping cart um, returning a shopping cart is easy, even if slightly inconvenient. And it's also an act we all recognize as the right one. We right. recognize this without being forced to do it and without any promises of reward. Mm-hmm. We will not be punished for failing to return it, and we will have gained nothing other than the satisfaction of having done the right thing. We should return a shopping cart for no other reason than it's a responsibility that we owe each other. Mm -hmm. Doing the right thing when no one is watching and without the promise of reward or, or or what I'm calling moral integrity depends on our capacity for morally autonomous action. And so I don't think you can have any of this framework unless you're within the ethical non-naturalist framework. I think Mm -hmm. once, once we move to your model, moral autonomy is just completely lost. All right. So let's, (laughs) So I'm going to push back here. One of the main reasons why the autonomous agent subjects himself to the state isn't because uh, he wants to be uh, a less a, someone who's less than an agent, but rather someone who's more than an agent. When I am um, a responsible citizen of the state, when I accept that as my identity and freely accept that no less, I am not less free. I am more free because of the fact that I pay my taxes, uh, vote, participate in the Commonwealth, uh, do all of these things at, in my role as citizen, one that I freely take up and, and follow, I actually can do more things than if I was to do all that for myself. In the similar way, when God um, decides to uh, leave us away from the beatific vision. He kicks us, as it's said in, uh, in, the, in uh, Genesis, out of the Garden of Eden, our ancestors. We no longer get to look at, upon the beatific vision. We no longer get to look upon God, but rather we know God not directly, but indirectly through creation. There are times when everyone sins, everyone falls short, but notice there, those are points where we choose to ignore um, a God where we can delve into sort of like a, a moment of atheism, if you will. And it's at that moment where uh, we don't become more free, we become less free because we're subjugating our will, we're subjugating um, ourselves to our baser, more animalistic instincts, uh, whatever they might be, and, and our temptations. Uh, so, for example, when I choose, even knowing God. Well, no, at the end of it, when I choose to lie to somebody, um, I'm actually not exercising freedom, but rather I'm giving in to debasing myself because as a rational agent, somebody who uh, is made to know the truth, I am separating myself from it. And uh, just so I don't keep uh, rambling, the point is here. Uh, the reason why we postulate uh, God, the reason why we postulate uh, the faith as a postulate of practical reason here is be- and uh, one that's n- not directly known but only mediated by creation is for the fact that when we as Christians uh, ascend to the faith, when we hope for that which is unseen, we do it freely, not because our reward is seen. If it's seen, it's not hope. And since we do all that, we take up our role as citizens of God's kingdom autonomously. We do it and we become more free. When we do it, we improve morally. We can exercise our judgments over our affections and our desires for everything else. Um, I might have uh, a predil- I might value pizza a lot, but because of my more sound judgment, hopefully, I can take up and pick up criteria when it's good and proper to and when it isn't. And in the same way, um, our affection for um, for our duties and obligations, um, ones that are evaluated afterwards, um, that's something we appreciate in and of themselves. And I think when you have God, what ends up happening is uh, not only do you have that 
uh, uh, that um, will towards him, which is mediated by creation, which isn't known, which has to be hoped for, um, the believer is stuck having to assent to faith through an, an assessment of his reason. So uh, my point is in doing both of those things, we can have the affection for loving creation, loving the things in the world, but they're but we're not determined by them because we also have the will to love uh, love our good, our duties towards one another, and uh, love our obligations as well. Um, when I think of my obligations towards God, uh, he's not there with a voice over my head saying, don't do this, John, stop it. What are you doing? And what ends up happening is he leaves me to choose to assent or fall uh, based on my own will. I think that is actually one of the benefits of this, you know, Kantian reading of uh, Christianity. And I think that, and I think it's one which has its positives. So I don't, and if Kant himself was, you know, able to see himself as uh, a Lutheran and someone who didn't have this really affect his faith, I, I don't really see the big issue or the big contradiction in uh, in having the autonomous will, but at the same time recognizing that um, the autonomous will is assenting in faith to hopes of better promises and a better recollection of what he values and what he is obliged to do. So I guess um, I'll just I'll borrow a yeah. bit. Um, and real quick, guys, let's go about seven more minutes or so, and then we'll do some Q and A. Sounds good. Okay. Um, I'll just I'll borrow a quip um, from Laplace, um, in that I it seems that to get this, we just I don't have any need for that hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, in order to get the moral autonomy kind of social contract. Um, view that you were laying out saying how um, by paying taxes and being an individual part of the state, we can be more free. Um, and so what do I mean by I, I don't have any need for the hypothesis of God here? Um, it mm -hmm. seems like you inserted God into that picture and he was fulfilling this kind of contractualist role mm -hmm. in that um, assenting to him and having this um, relationship of owing something to him um, added this feature to morality that just wouldn't otherwise be there. And so where I would want to put to push back and say that mm -hmm. there is this contractualist feature, we, we do owe things to other people. So for example, there are ways we could act, we could treat other people in ways that were unjustifiable to them, that we, we could treat someone in a way that we couldn't justify to other people how we were treating them. We might be treating them mm -hmm. in some way that they could not rationally consent. Mm -hmm. um, we might act on principles that no one could reasonably reject. And so by acting on principles that no one re reasonably rejects, by constraining our behavior, we make ourselves more free. So I'm not sure what, fee what function God serves for moral autonomy um, on your model. So if we stick with Kant, mm -hmm. so Kant didn't think that God was a necessary feature of morality. So he had this moral autonomy. God doesn't play a part of it. Where God featured into his system is that he saw um, rational self-interest and moral obligation coming into conflict with each other. And so God's role is, is to align morality and self-interest so that behaving morally is is going to be in our self-interest that's how kant puts um god into the picture i bite that bullet i just say look no self-interest and morality are on are, are on a collision course and what makes acting moral so difficult in certain situations is because it's not in your self-interest doing the right thing is hard <laughs> um so how, how, what, what feature is God doing in your system here for moral autonomy? Do you have a similar Kantian feature where he's aligning morality and self-interest or is it just, it's kind of this God is necessary for the formulation of the categorical imperative Kant called the kingdom of ends. 
God is just a necessary part of the kingdom of ends and the universal law that's universalizable such mm-hmm. that we can bring about this kingdom of ends. I, I'm trying to figure out what role God plays for moral autonomy that's essential. Right. You can use the rest of the time. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I would actually say he does, yeah, God does serve this role. He does reconcile our self-interests and he does reconcile uh, the need to act for others and and the inter- and our interests for one another. I think he does serve that practical end, but also I brought up the argument earlier about uh, moral perfection. When it comes to uh, the fact that I seem to oblige myself to every uh, cri- every ought that I give myself, every uh, sort of obligation after every criteria of evaluation. When I look about what I should be doing, what am I drawn to, and I make the decision given my attraction to to uh, this and given criteria X, Y, Z, which is just like all the relevant facts, I seem to be committing myself to this. And yet I'm constantly falling short. Why should I even resume doing this? Um, If I ought to act in this way, if I ought to follow all of my dictates, it shows that I can do it. It shows that I am capable of doing this, but it doesn't seem that anyone is like looking at the facts about the world around us, no one's able to live up to their own standards. Um, even guys who do quite a bit, uh, Peter Singer, uh, I mentioned him. Even he says, yeah, I, sure, I give a lot of my money, donate that to third world nations. Uh, could I be um, you know, uh, giving money that I spent on a movie? Sure, but what can you do? Like Even he, uh, in his talk with John Hare, said he, he fell short at times. It seems like we have these two urges that uh, we have the urge to be morally perfect and to expect it from other people. But at the same time, we have this defeatist attitude that knows this is not the world where we could do it, that it kind of pushes uh, belief towards a supernatural, pushes belief towards a state of affairs where it is uh, something we can accomplish. Even like according, even one of the uh, objections to that is, well, are you really saying that, you know, God just regenerates you and makes you perfect. Uh, even in Catholicism, we have a notion of purgatory. I, I could not imagine what just waking up in heaven morally perfect, given my life on earth. Um, I don't even think if I woke up to a version of me that didn't sin or didn't have these the desires that I do fight on a continuous basis, that that would even be the same person. I, I think that moral perfection requires that long struggle and, and requires something like a process of sanctification and a process of feeling better that I don't think um, a, a sort of secularism can provide. So uh, I'll leave my that there. Uh, do you want to get to questions or, or Ben, did you just uh, want to say one more thing? No, we'll go ahead and move into questions. I spoke first and so mm-hmm. it's good dialectical etiquette to, uh, to have you end. Uh, thanks. All right. Yeah, thanks for that. All right. So moving into questions, this is from Ben. Yes, yes, if I'm pronouncing it right. So for both, how do your views respond to the moral expert disagreement, profound moral disagreement among experts, seem a higher order evidence against moral realism? Uh, ben, can I uh, take a crack at that first? Absolutely. All right. So the, my first thought was, well, no, that's to be expected. We live in a fallen world. But then I'm like, well, I mean, doesn't that just push it back to religious disagreement? So um, there is that point, but uh, I think that has to be dealt with at a, at a separate basis. So I'll say that um, from my perspective, it's mostly about a state of being in a fallen world that, that sort of explains this. And um, just to add to uh, Vincenzo's point, you could, there's actually an article that highlighted that professors of ethics, the people that we would expect to be moral realists uh, and to follow a, a system of ethics who actually fall very short. Many of them, uh, for example, said it's wrong to eat animals, uh, somewhere like 60%, but only like 29% said they they were vegan. So uh, try figuring that one out. Uh, maybe we could call this the art, the meager fruits of moral realism. So, uh, so yeah, I would explain this like religious in terms of a religious anthropology but i don't think that's going to be convincing for anyone who doesn't already hold to the theology um so i'm just going to say that i just don't think it's a very strong um 
objection because I just don't think it's true. Um, so let me qualify that by saying that there's obviously disagreement in moral philosophy departments, um, but those are generally over um, controversial issues in applied ethics. So I think in normative ethics, um, the perception of very, very deep disagreements um, is largely superficial. So I think most ethicists would agree that pain is bad, that we shouldn't lie, that we shouldn't steal, um, basically common morality. I think common morality is not only um, more or less universal across um, cultures, um, but I also think in the academy. Um, you know, moral philosophers, when it comes to basic moral truths, are more or less on the page. It's when um, you start to get into more complex moral situations um, that disagreement starts to um, very widely. And moral philosophy is one of those views that doesn't have the luxury of um, empirical results that can settle these sorts of disagreements. So again, because I'm a non-naturalist, I think that you know the natural facts that are studied by the natural sciences just aren't going to be able to help us in the do in in the ethical domains. So you know we might have a test that can settle whether or not we can extend human life by hundreds of years, but there is no test, there is no empirical test that's going to settle the question of whether or not we should extend human lives hundreds of years in the future. It, these are the, it's just the nature of the inquiry. Um, but when it comes to truth, most philosophers and most people um, that aren't moral philosophers will agree that extending life is a good thing. When it comes to the basic moral truths, there, there just is widespread disagreement. I mean, right, widespread agreement. So I think that the the disagreement that is often appealed to is largely superficial or just non-existent. Right. Um, I'm muted now. Okay, for Ben, do you think there's a possible world where I could do X and end up not doing X? Well, of course. So you could, there's... It happens all the time. Um, we all have aims um, that we could achieve and that we just end up not achieving. And then question for John, what is a natural fact? Uh, a fact about a concrete state of affairs. That is to say about something in the world and that could be um, something spiritual, like a, a soul, an angel, God, or something physical. Um, so tables, chairs, uh, that sort of thing. That's that's how I basically went about it. It's it's a very a large. Fact. I'm sorry, a, a causal, causal fact. fact. Exactly. Um, so so that's basically how I would understand it. We we opened up what's called moral naturalism to be so wide as to include divine command theory. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, ethics professors are going to be very angry. At, not at you, Ben, not me. So, the, so this is a, um, another objection that I just, I don't find um, very strong. A lot of, uh, you hear a lot of times, you know, well, natural fact is just, it's just too unclear of a concept. Well, yeah, it, it can be a difficult concept, yeah. but we can get it clear enough for our discussion to where, you know, we can be on the same page about it. I, right. I know what you're trying to get at by natural fact. We're, we're, we're not in the same camp, but we can agree on the, on the same concept. So I just, I don't know. I just don't see, I don't see it as a powerful objection to meta ethics. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. I mean, it, it is just a, a question of terms. Like if you don't, if we don't want to call uh, this theory um, moral naturalism, we'll call it moral maturism, so, something like yeah. that, just, just to continue the conversation. Right. And then question for both from Emerson. What is the relationship between the conscience and moral facts as you conceive of them respectively? So my answer was moral autonomy. So um, I, when I characterized responsibility and integrity, integrity, that's how I was relating um, moral facts to consciousness. So um, consciousness is we are accountable to ourselves with reason. We are accountable to the inner abhorrence um, of our own self-contempt, 
when we do something wrong and you know we know we've done something wrong, the penalty for that is self-contempt and inner, inner abhorrence. That's how consciousness plays into a reason. And this can this happens not just in the moral domain, but in the um, epistemic domain. When we mm. do when we when we make a careless mistake on a test, when we do so, when we make a stupid mistake. Um, or we fail to study like we should have for some sort of, t- you know, these are just all ways in which it's the same. It's, it's, it's targeting the same faculty. The, 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 the same faculty is playing a similar function. Mm. All right. Uh, as for myself, uh, consciousness is a necessary ingredient for, um, moral, for, uh, moral relations and for facts about morality. If there was a world where, you know, only rocks existed. Well, there won't be any moral facts. Everything would just be inert. Um, and and there would be no purpose of interaction. Uh, agents r- require consciousness in the sense that um, we need I a think he means conscience, not oh, conscious. Oh, oh, yeah. It's yeah. Emerson, so. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a totally an understandable mistake to make with Emerson. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was like, right. well, before he gets too deep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. Um, so conscience, in in my understanding, I, I would just co- um, completely co-sign with all of what Ben said, but I would also include um, the following. Um, it also gives us and establishes a sense of uh, guilt and obligation around the fact. So it's not just the sense that these facts are things like we understand, like I, I'm really not motivated by math too much. I know some people geek out over it, but like, I don't really care. But when it comes to what I should and shouldn't be doing, it's it's definitely motivating me. There's definitely something pushing me uh, towards a particular end. So I, I think that one of the things about morality that needs to be answered is what motivates us to be moral? What What is it about these facts that push us to act in a certain way. So, uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's how it figures. It's some it it explains the very social dynamic that I think uh, this theory really holds a, a high. And then, question for John: How do you respond not only to so you had touched on this earlier, but moral mm-hmm. expert disagreement, but also to religious disagreement. Different religions have different moral codes. Why do you think that yours is the correct or true one? Yeah, so that's something that requires like additional arguments uh, aside from the one I gave. But um, John Hare actually wrote a whole book in uh, using this kind of moral framework as a, a defense of Christianity. So one of the... Uh, one of the practical benefits I think of Christianity is uh, the following. Uh, you actually have, it's built around a sort of personal relationship with God incarnate. Uh, the person that you are seeking is someone who makes himself known in history. Um, it's a religion that um, allows you to grow in perfection in the sense that it gives you a, a certain exemplar to follow. Um, and um, someone incarnate on earth that you yourself can uh, look up to or look back to and, and follow in his example. And it's also a chan- It's also a system that provides uh, a kind of end in growth where you know where you need to be and you could take, in a sense, take up your cross and follow it. So I think that uh, the person of Jesus of Nazareth is bas- it basically providing a very heavy role as not just your object of worship, but also an object, an exemplar of virtue that you should uh, follow after. And I know that's mostly um, uh, an appeal to virtue ethics, and I'm really sorry from, uh, for uh, appealing to, to that framework, but I think that uh, what virtue ethics always tries to get at, I think that having you know a concrete uh, virtuous exemplar uh, does have that benefit to your system, even if your system is mostly deontological. And then this was a question posed earlier. This will be our last question, though. But um, so John Buck says, I subscribe to a causal theory of knowledge to avoid Gettier cases. Does this preclude me from having non-natural moral knowledge? No, I don't think so. Um, So non-natural moral knowledge is not 
so non-natural knowledge is not limited to moral knowledge. So like I was saying, there was non-moral um, reasoning. So I think just practical reasoning would also be non-natural. Epistemic reasoning would be non-natural. But I also think things like logic and mathematics and modality, things like poss possibility, necessity, I think these are also non-natural properties. So um, some argument might have the property of being valid. So the property of validness is not a natural property. That's a non-natural property. The property of being evidence is a non-natural property. Um, the, uh, the fossil record has the property of being evidence for biological evolution, but the property of being evidence is not something I have to dig around in the fossil record to find. It's a non-natural property. I'm really digging nominalism right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, yeah. So, like, this is going to be, you know, it, it, to wed my view with a nominalist view is going to, it's going to take some work. Um, mm. I, I don't think that the questions that nominalists and Platonists asks are, ask are qu clear enough to really mm. have questions. I kind of, take the quietest route here in that um, I think there's just, there just, there just obviously are these universals. There are these, these properties that cannot be described in natural terms that are just features of the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think of like a, a more Aristotelian approach? You know, like these universals are just in some sense existent, um, in concrete entities? Yeah, I think that view's kind of confused. I think both Plato and Aristotle's view are just kind of products of their time in certain ways. So I think that Plato made some very weird claims um, that made it sound like, you know, the, the, the realm of forms is this actual existent realm with these perfect exemplars in them and Aristotle. Oh, no, 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 that is, uh, okay, so that historical analysis is, is wrong, like, that's, Fair enough. Not, no, like, uh, the, like, the idea that these uh, exemplars are, the idea that the forms are, like, these perfect exemplars is actually something that was propagated later by Plutinus. Uh, yeah, well, so yeah. that, that view, I definitely, whoever it came from, whatever, I think that's confused, and I, so I think that mm. Aristotle gives some famous arguments um, in which he tries to give a reductio of Plato's view um, of the forms for some number, and it just, I, I, I just, I, I thought that 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 whole bit is just confused, and so I'm kind of a quietist these days about are you a nominalist or are you a Platonist? Well, I don't, I don't really think that these questions are clear enough to have answers. I think that it just we we. We, we have to admit that there are these, there are universals and there are concrete properties. And so we can have some more theories beyond that, but I just, I don't, I don't really know what those look like. And I haven't dug deep enough into it yet. To... Uh, I would suggest reading Scott Berman's book, Platonism and the Objects of Science. He, he defends a Platonist view, but he also goes into the history of it and it's quite hilarious. He, uh, he says, um, the name sounds so familiar. Uh, Alex to... Alex Malpass interviewed him. That's where. That's why it yeah. sounds familiar. Okay. Yeah, he's yeah gotcha. he said theoretically yeah um, one excerpt from his book that I really like uh, the non spatio temporal thing called redness is so far from being the perfect example of itself that it's actually the worst example of a red thing you could possibly pick. Why? Because redness is not any color at all, nor could it be. In order for something to reflect light at all, it has to be spatio temporal. Therefore, since redness is neither spatial nor temporal, it cannot reflect light. And the difficulty generalizes to the vast majority of non-spatial temporal things. Um, so humanness would be the worst example of being human. Imagine humanness just like existing there, unable to breathe and, and walk <laughs> around. So, so yeah, uh, it, it's not, Berman basically defends Plato and even Aristotle's views aren't as wacky as they seem. Um, so when Aristotle says, that redness exists in the thing he's all he's saying is yeah it's just the way something exists um so when we speak about the form of a house like that doesn't exist apart from the matter like you can't really separate it like even a lot of aristotle's views uh, people have argued that 
those were kind of distorted by the scholastics. But eh, to be fair, I sure. like whether the scholastics took it, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that. Um, I think we'll go ahead and close there. But yeah, definitely check out um, their links in the description to see more videos from these guys. And I think everybody for coming on and thanks for having this debate thanks for inviting me and john thanks, thanks uh for participating in this with me this was a lot of fun yeah th thank you uh you were i don't really even regard this as a debate it's it, it was a very fruitful dialogue i think i um learned some when philosophers fairly... really get into like do philosophy it's much more discussion than it is a debate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I think the whole debating thing comes on like when it's the internet and people just want to uh, propagate yeah, their yeah, opinions. Yeah. yeah. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. All right. Well, thanks. I'll go ahead and end it there.